I remember there was uh, one particular classroom, Mrs. Kramer, allowed this girl to do current event articles on my father. It was really bad. And my mother went crazy, and she went and confronted the teacher. Um, I don't think she ever really liked me, Mrs. Kramer. I surmise to this day that she didn't like me because of my family. This is John Francis Jr. He was born in 1960 on the north shore of Long Island. His father, John Sonny Francis, was the longtime underboss for the Colombo crime family, one of the so-called five families of New York. There's never been a guy like Sonny, an FBI agent once said. There'll never be another guy like Sonny, the last of a dying breed. What type of father was your father like? What type of father was he? I'm glad you asked, because as a dad, he was a really great guy. I know he loved me playing baseball, and I was, I remember this because it was really important to me. But my first year of baseball, this is the, one of the best times of my dad I remember. I was really bad my first year, and I made the last out of the last play and I hit the ball, and I was so happy I hit it. I ran so fast to first base, but I, I got called out, because I was out. And I was all depressed, like I thought I'd get my one hit. And I thought my dad would be really upset, because, you know, I always thought he wanted me to be this great player, and I'm sure he did. But when I was walking back with my head down, he said, hey, son, don't feel bad. He says, you got better all year long. He says, you see the way you hustled on that? That's all that matter. You made contact. That's a start. Next year, we'll we'll make more contact. And I was surprised. And these days, I often wonder if it was me so much that I wanted to please him. I thought he wanted different things for me than he actually did. John's father, Sonny Francis, was born in Naples in 1917 and grew up in New York City. Sonny's father, Carmine, ran a bakery in Brooklyn where, reportedly, sometimes he put people he didn't like into the oven. Sonny was arrested for the first time when he was 21 for assault, and he was discharged from the Army during World War II because of, quote, homicidal tendencies. Then, according to Life magazine, he fought and murdered his way into the Mafia's front rank. He hung out with Frank Sinatra and Sammy Davis Jr. at the Copacabana nightclub. In 1967, he went to prison for bank robbery and has been in and out ever since. He's never been convicted of murder, but he once said, I killed a lot of guys. You're not talking about four, five, six, ten. In that same conversation reported by prosecutors, he explained how best to dispose of a dead body. It involved a microwave, a kiddie pool, and patience. Because he lived on Long Island, people said Sonny Francis brought the mafia to the suburbs. What was life like around the house? Well, my dad would leave after we left for school, and he'd always be home for dinner. Um... And he'd always take us to work when he had off. So we generally would go into Manhattan. He had offices there. Generally, the music business and entertainment field is what I thought was his job. Sonny Francis did a lot of business with a lot of different people, sometimes in the music business, also the film industry. He helped fund the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Deep Throat. He had a financial interest in various nightclubs, restaurants, and strip clubs. But Assistant U.S. Attorney Christina Poza once said, he's never held an honest job for a day in his life and is largely responsible for the glamorization of the mafia over the past century. I remember kids would always say from, like, fourth grade on that I was the richest kid in school. Um... We never needed for anything. If he needed one baseball glove, he'd get three. When he was a kid, he got a dirt bike. And when he got older, he got a new car every year, sometimes more than one a year. 
John told us he spent about $18,000 a month on clothing, except for one month, when he spent 31000 He never left the house with less than 1500 cash in his pocket. This was the late 70s. Did you ever watch The Sopranos or The Godfather? Yes. The, what do you think about the way that organized crime, the mafia, is portrayed in, in those shows? Well, I think they, The Godfather did an accurate job of little things people don't notice. But, uh, but The Sopranos did at times, but they over... I, it was phenomenal. I love The Sopranos. But there are some things that are silly. I don't remember exactly what. But uh, it was just too over the top sometimes, uh, like Tony keeping his money in his house. That doesn't happen. Uh, they, they keep some money, but not those kind of amounts of money, because you know you're going to get arrested someday, you know, or they might come and raid you. Growing up, John knew his family had money. He knew his father was somebody that people talked about. But he didn't really know what was going on until his older brother sat him down and told him the honest truth about the family business. And, I mean, he explained everything about captains, the boss, the the underboss, the consigliere, and I mean, I'm this kid in there, and it's like, it's like the minute he said that, I felt like I belonged. Like, all these years, I have been, fi- like, confused about something. And when he said that, I liked it. From that moment on, I was, and and he was like talking like, this is our life. So I assumed, okay, this is my life too, I guess. John started hanging around with his brother and father and other Colombo crime family associates. He called them all uncles, and he felt grown up. He remembers that people would get out of their way. They could get into any club they wanted. Then he started to actually do some work for his father. Sonny had too much FBI surveillance on him, but John was still young. He could move around more freely. He would deliver messages. He says often they were in code, and he didn't know what they meant. He remembers that sometimes the message would be about vegetables, whether something was a good vegetable or not, where it was grown. By the time he was 18, John says he was working as a bag man, collecting and dropping off bags of extortion money. I, I became a, a bit of a bully. I took advantage of things because I could. It was more like, you know, I, it, it just happened and I played the part. And I, I realized, well, around that time, I remember the one thing that I... Uh, that my dad actually asked me. He said, I'll give you anything you want on this earth. One thing I'm going to tell you is never embarrass us. Don't ever embarrass us. And I I remember those words. On June 4th, 2008, Sonny Francis, along with fellow Colombo family members, was indicted on charges of racketeering conspiracy, robbery, extortion, narcotics trafficking, and loan sharking. It obviously wasn't Sonny's first time in court, not by a long shot. What made this trial different was the presence of one FBI informant in particular, an informant who'd worn a wire for eight months and could talk to Sonny the way few others could. I'm Phoebe Judge. This is Criminal. I'm a rat. I mean, I I am. But there's a little difference. Uh, Doesn't make it better, but there's a difference. I didn't do it to get out of trouble. Um, I did it because our way of life is a bad way of life. I felt I owed something. John's testimony against his father was big news. Headlines like, Mafia boss faces prison after son breaks code of silence. John was repeatedly called a turncoat and a rat. One New York Post headline read, Rat's my boy. What is that like to tell, to be telling your story, uh, you know, 
to the outside world. You know, a lot has been said about you by the media, right? A lot of people have said, talked about you. But what is it like for you to be talking about your experiences on the other side? Well, this is odd for me. He's been through a lot. He first went into rehab when he was 25. He says he would disappear and then show up at his family's house, a mess. Now, my mom would let me in the house, but you don't want to go in the house with my mother while I'm stoned and high. She was a terror. You'd rather be around my father. My mom wasn't afraid of anything. Woo. She'd blow your high and your drunk. It was terrible. He stole money from his family. He says he once stole his sister's car. Like something would happen, I'd get arrested, I'd get sick. I'd, I'd come home to my mother's house, and then I'd start a period of, let's say, you know, seemingly reconstruction, only to drink or get high again. I contracted HIV and diagnosed in 1990. I know I got it in the, before 86, because I stopped using needles in 1986. And so, for 11 years of my life, and I'm going to this 12-step program. I'm not going to mention the name. I'm not supposed to. It's anonymous, but I could say 12-step. Okay. So I'm going to this 12-step program from 1985 till 2001, and I'm drinking and getting high the whole time through it. He says things started to change when he met a guy at a meeting. His name was Daryl. He was never afraid to tell me, you are so sick. He'd tell me I was sick in the head, that I don't even understand anything, and why are you dressing like a, you're a 41-year-old grown man, you're dressing like a, a rap star at 41 years old, and he'd just say all this stuff. And somehow, all of this came bearing down on me. He applied for Section 8 housing and for disability, and he stayed sober. Then in 2004, he got a call from the FBI. He says it's common for FBI agents to call members of mob families and try and get them to flip, just part of the business. But on this day, maybe because his life was different, John listened. The FBI agent asked John if he'd been willing to gather information about his father, Sonny. I said, okay. John Francis was approached by the FBI in 2004 to provide information about his father. And for much of 2005, he wore a wire and recorded any conversations he could. What, what was the evidence that you provided? Oh, there was like 400 hours of tape. In a March 10, 2005 recording, Sonny scolded John for failing to collect an overdue extortion payment. He said, I would have grabbed Carmine and told him, Look, you rat bastard, go out there and get the money and bring it here. And if he doesn't give it to you, leave him on the floor. John also recorded conversations between Sonny and other Colombo family associates about extorting strip clubs and a pizza place. During one, someone says, you can't go in and bang their brains out. You got to make yourself known. You got to be nice and easy. John also got his father on tape admitting he was the underboss of the Colombo family. During Sonny's 2010 trial, John explained why he became an FBI informant. He said, I wanted to change my life. They would provide a means for me to change my life. Sonny's defense attorney suggested that the reason John informed on his elderly father was because the government was paying for his HIV treatments. He did it for the money, the lawyer said. There's no other reason. John's brother called it a betrayal and told reporters, the family is taking it very hard. Sonny Francis was sentenced to eight years in prison. He was 93. John's testimony also led to the conviction of three other Colombo family associates. Did you think to yourself, um... What will my father think of me? I know my father loves me. That's just the kind of guy he is. He may hate what I did, but he just takes everything in stride. He's a 
My sister Lorraine once said to me when I was a kid that my fa our father has no cognitive dissonance. He was a gangster and he thought like a gangster. He never left that mentality. You want to know, I, uh, I know this may sound crazy. Me and my dad had a, an understanding that no matter what, we don't let anyone kill anyone in our family. Uh, I do know that there, there probably are people who would kill me. What happened when you entered witness protection? Tell me the first steps and where you went and who you became. Hey, this is kind of important to me because the government, all through this, they weren't perfect, but I always knew where I stood clearly. I know that that was never the case with my mom or my dad. The United States government was very fair. Um, <clears throat> it's a very weird thing. They throw your phone in a sink. <laughs> what, you standing there and you watch it explode or whatever, it jumps around, all your pictures and everything. That's difficult, but they do prepare you. There's a psychological evaluation you go through. Um, and then you go to a, uh, I went, they took me to a, a place, uh, and I stood there about four months. You stay by yourself. You travel with a, a travel ID, different name. It's not your uh, stationary or permanent. It's transitory. And they give it to you on the plane, and then they take it back from you when you get in the darn hotel. So now it's pretty scary because I'm staying in a hotel with no ID, and, and they did make consolations for me to... Uh, they said I, I asked them for... I think I asked them for two things, that I didn't lose my disability or Medicare and that I could go to 12-step uh, meetings anytime I needed to. He was relocated to Oklahoma City, and initially, he was given $1,200 a month to live on. Then he says he was sent to Dallas, and then sent to South Carolina. He was there for two years. But he got scared he told a friend too much, and so they moved him again to Austin. And then in 2008, he was sent to Indianapolis. Uh, the government asks you to keep your same story. Just don't say the locations or be specific. So it was very easy for it to fill right in with, uh, with I'm from the, yeah, I'm from New York. Sometimes people ask you, is your dad home? Is your mother home? Why don't you speak to them? And so I just said, I, uh, my family's not happy with me. In June of 2017, Sonny Francis was released from prison at 100 years old. There are some newspaper stories about his release, and on one of them, someone posted a comment saying they knew John and that he was living in Indianapolis. John says he was told he needed to relocate immediately, but he said no. He was sick of moving around. He left the Witness Protection Program. He's been out for a year now. Have you, um, have you spoken to your father? No, I haven't. Do you think you will before he dies? Well, it's a funny thing. I tried, um, when I was in the, uh, the program, uh, I tried to write a letter, and I think the program said, at first they allowed me to send letters to my mom and dad, and I did. And he never spoke to me. Well, my mom said he got the letter and he said he loves you. Maybe she was just saying that. Um, I don't know. I haven't gotten any response uh, from him. Do you, do you have a relationship with your brother, with your other siblings? I think within our family and uh, the neighborhood, people we know would kind of shun them if they knew they were talking to me or close with me. It's hard for people to forgive or, well, who the hell am I thinking? I would have never forgiven me either. So I understand how they think. And that's just the way it is. 
And, you know, my, my brothers and sisters have kids. And their kids come from those neighborhoods and have a family, you know, our cousins and the people they know. It, it, it might bring some unwanted uh, difficulties to them. But I think personally, my brothers and sisters love me. I'm sure we would get along well if we were together, whether they said it or not. We talked with him in his home in Indianapolis. His life now is different from how he grew up. No fancy cars, no expensive clothes. He lives in a small apartment with his cat. It's funny to think about the life that you've had. And then to think about you here in this little house in Indianapolis, tucked away. Are you scared sometimes? Honestly, yeah. Yeah. Every now and then that gets to me. When we were finishing up this episode, I sent John a text message. I asked what, if anything, the Witness Protection Program told him when he decided to leave. Here's what he replied. Three days after I signed out, the assistant U.S. District Attorney called me and asked if I wanted to go back in the program. She also said if I had any problems, to please call her, that they would always be as helpful to me as they could, but to let them know if anything didn't seem right. They also implied that it would not be a good idea to go to New York, and that there's a very good chance that people are still looking to hurt me. John doesn't seem to want to go back to New York and to his old life anyway. He likes Indianapolis. He named his cat Indy. But he still talks and worries about what people might think of him and what he did. I, I think it's hard to talk about. I think if people see my life, if people see my life, they might understand better. Uh, look, I... I think it's really good to set a goal, go out and become successful. I like that. I don't know if that's... This is better for me. I'm built like this better. I fit better here. Criminal is created by Lauren Spore and me. Our senior producer is Nadia Wilson. Audio mix by Michael Raphael and Rob Byers. Julian Alexander makes original illustrations for each episode of Criminal. You can see them at thisiscriminal.com. We're on Facebook and Twitter at Criminal Show. Criminal is recorded in the studios of North Carolina Public Radio, WUNC. We're a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX, a collection of the best podcasts around. We'll be back next year. I'm Phoebe Judge. This is Criminal. Radio Topia. From PR.